we are in a water crisis. The supplies in many parts of the country are, are stressed. The impact is that the businesses that depend on that water are maybe either not in business or are cutting back. People are losing jobs. The price of food is going up. It's a national problem. That harsh reality is now being felt around the country. The cause? Years of record low precipitation. Worse yet, the predictions about when or if our water will be replenished are dismaying. We Americans are spoiled. When we wake up in the morning, we turn on that tap, and out comes as much water as we want, for less than we pay for cell phone service or for cable television. When most of us think about water, we think of it as though it were the air, infinite and inexhaustible, when for all practical purposes, it's very finite and quite exhaustible. According to the U.S. Drought Monitor, many of the western U.S. states are in some stage of drought, and in some of those states, it is extreme or exceptional drought. Some of the hardest hit areas are in Arizona, where the drought monitor shows no normal precipitation anywhere in the state. The state has recently been hit by dust storms or haboobs, so large they swallow cities. And despite heavy rains in California, from time to time, every square mile of the state was recently in some stage of drought, with more than 14% of central California's agricultural heartland in the most extreme state of, quote, exceptional drought. I think that we're looking at a new, drier future. We're looking at a new normal. We've got severe drought in California. We have very significant drought in the Klamath River Basin in Oregon and California. Uh, record low levels of precipitation and river flow in the Rio Grande. There, there have been uh, drought issues in the southeast United States that's really unprecedented. And so this is not just a localized problem. Another state feeling the effects of drought is South Carolina. Farmers say their livelihoods depend more on water than other industries. Water is probably the most valuable commodity that we have. And it's probably funny to hear me say commodity, but it truly is. Hey girls, how are we doing? We're different than any other industry. As use the example a lot that I can't turn off the lights on Friday afternoon and go home and come back Monday and turn them on and things are okay. If we're in a situation where we don't have water, the animals or the crop that we're growing to feed the animals will just simply die. This country right now is hurting over oil, but we can get by with a lot less oil. If I had to, I could ride a bicycle a little bit or I could walk a little further, but I don't know any way that this country is gonna survive if we do not take the steps necessary now to protect this resource. Water shortages are so critical in South Carolina, the state filed what is called a case of original jurisdiction in 2007 against its neighbor to the north. Instead of taking North Carolina to state or federal district court, it sued in the Supreme Court over use of water from the Catawba River. South Carolina claimed North Carolina was drawing more than its fair share of water from the river both states use for hydroelectric power and water supplies. The justices agreed South Carolina had a viable claim, but kicked it over to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to divide up the water and hydroelectric power. The states eventually settled to work together. Other eastern states are also battling over water. Georgia is suing Tennessee for access to the Tennessee River's drinking water. In California, the lack of rain is so serious that in early 2014, President Obama visited drought-stricken California and pledged $183 million for drought relief programs. He also created seven regional climate hubs to help farmers and rural communities respond to the risks of climate change. California is our biggest economy. California is our biggest agricultural producer. So what happens here matters to every working American, right down to the cost of food that you put on your table. And everybody, from farmers to industry to residential areas to 
the north of California and the south of California and every place in between, as well as the entire western region, are going to have to start rethinking how we approach water for decades to come. So I want to make sure that every Californian knows uh, your country is going to be there for you when you need it uh, this year, but we're going to have to all work together uh, in the years to come to make sure that uh, we address the challenge and leave this incredible land uh, and bounty to our children and our grandchildren uh, in at least as good shape as we found it. Controversy over water in the Southwest is nothing new. An old Western saying goes, quote, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting over. But in the latter days of the Old West, there were just more than two million people living in the Southwest Water Basin. Now there are almost 40 million. Much of the increase was driven by legal and illegal immigration. Mexicans in particular flee a country that is drier still than the U.S., killing Mexico's agriculture industry and lots of jobs. In the late 1800s, attempts were made to harness the Colorado River to supply irrigation for farmers and for settlement. However, a massive flood in 1905, destroying everything in its way, proved the river needed to be controlled. To settle claims to the water in 1922, then Commerce Secretary Herbert Hoover assembled delegates and divided the Colorado River's water among seven states. The Colorado River Compact divided the river into the lower river basin, which served Arizona, California, and Nevada, and the upper river basin, which included New Mexico, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado. And years later, Mexico was added. It was the first example in history of a comprehensive interstate compact to deal with allocation of water rights. The thunder of man's determination to conquer the Colorado reverberated between the sheer cliffs of Black Canyon as construction got underway. The Hoover Dam was built to control floods, provide irrigation, and produce hydroelectric power. It broke construction in 1931 across two states, Arizona and Nevada. This modern civil engineering wonder stood completed two and one half years ahead of schedule. The building of the dam also created Lake Mead, a holding place for water for the basin region, and one of the largest man-made lakes in the world, creating 550 miles of shoreline and covering 247 square miles of land. Lake Mead and downstream releases from the dam provide water for cities and for irrigation to farmers in the upper and lower river basin states. At the dam's base are huge turbines that drive water to produce electricity for three states, Nevada, Arizona, and mainly California. But years of drought and record population growth in the Southwest, fueled in large part by immigration, have siphoned off the once plentiful 1,450-mile winding Colorado River. The river, which once flowed all the way to Mexico, and emptied into the Gulf of California, dries up before it ever gets there. To bring attention to the unsustainable demands draining the river, actor and director Robert Redford teamed with his son to film a documentary about the Colorado. With populations in the region expected to reach 50 million by 2050, temperatures rising and precipitation patterns becoming more erratic, Demand will outpace supply unless we embrace a new water ethic. One that questions not only how we use water, but how it affects the world around us. Redford also launched a campaign with RaiseTheRiver.org, urging people to help reconnect the Colorado River with the Gulf of Mexico. The Colorado River is one of the most loved and hardest working rivers in the world. But we've overused it. Most years, the river dries up even before it reaches the sea. By adding just a small amount of water to the river's flow, we can help bring life back to the wetlands and marshes in the Delta. So please, would you join me in RaiseTheRiver.org and find out how you can get involved? 
That's exactly what started to happen in early 2014. In a three-year partnership between the U.S. and Mexico, water from the Colorado was released at the U.S.-Mexico border into the riverbed, where water hasn't flowed regularly since 1960. The goal? To reintroduce water into the delta and begin to restore key parts of its ecosystem. Overuse and lack of water from snowmelt has slowly drained Lake Mead. Once at 1,200 feet, it's now at an all-time low of 1,100 feet. As a result, marinas and boat launch ramps have either needed to be moved to another part of the lake or have closed down completely. The drain on the lake has also left its mark. A prominent white bathtub ring of mineral deposits around the lake, formerly covered by water. Nearly 40 million people rely on the Colorado River as a source of water and power. It irrigates nearly five and a half million acres of land and is the lifeblood for at least 22 federally recognized Native American tribes, seven national wildlife refuges, four national recreation areas, and 11 national parks. As Native peoples, we have a vested interest in, in terms of, you know, um, the protection and the sustainability uh, of the Colorado River as it is, in our minds, the lifeblood of who we are culturally and physically. A two-year landmark study by the Bureau of Reclamation on the basin water supply revealed this scary fact, quote, by mid-century, the average yield of the Colorado could be reduced by 10 to 20 percent due to climate change, Meanwhile, the basin states include some of the fastest growing urban and industrial areas in the U.S. Increasing demands coupled with decreasing supplies will exacerbate imbalances throughout the basin in the future, end quote. There's about a 3.2 million acre foot imbalance between supply and demand projected at the 50 year point. I think we all recognize that. And we know that there's urgency around creating new solutions um, because the hydrology is getting drier more quickly than we had anticipated. And we're currently in the midst of a really unprecedented 15-year drought. And our existing operations and infrastructure aren't set up to handle that kind of hydrology. One state's history was built on water rights, Nevada. There's every reason to be concerned about the security of the water supply in the Western United States, uh, but you gotta come to work every day, uh, come up with new solutions and make sure that doesn't happen. For us, the physical problem is if Lake Mead goes below elevation 1,000, neither of our current intakes will pump that water into the valley. We will lose 100% of our access to 90% of the water for seven out of every 10 people that live in the state of Nevada. The Southern Nevada Water Authority was formed in 1991 to address Southern Nevada's water needs. This after decades of population growth, increasing the number of state residents from 1.3 million to 2.8 million. Since 70% of Nevada's water is used for landscaping, the Water Authority started giving money to residents to transition from green to landscaping that requires very little water. The Water Smart Landscapes program gives incentives to residents and commercial property owners. The incentive was at 40 cents per square foot in 1997. Now it's at $2 per square foot a cost of about $200 million to the state. The plan has helped save water, but the Water Authority is constantly reminding residents through a series of attention-getting ads not to waste water. Sister Agnes? Ronald? Hands! To find your watering schedule, go to changeyourclock.com.
In 2003, the Colorado River had its worst drought year on record. The Water Authority took an even harsher step and adopted an entire suite of conservation measures, including landscaping restrictions for new development, mandatory watering schedules, wastewater ordinances, and golf course water budgets. Oh, we just missed this guy. The Water Authority even put water investigators on the case. The water police patrol neighborhoods looking for waste. So what we'll do is look for a property that's watering on the wrong day. Any water sprays or flows, including watering outside the assigned times, attract attention. Water was running off the property and into the gutter, so it was overwatering at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was a day of week violation as well. Water Group F is only supposed to water on Saturdays. This is Investigator 7565. It is Tuesday, February 11th, 4.30 p.m. We have a leak in the main service line leading up to the property, approximately two feet behind the meter. Marked it with a yellow flag and left a door hanger for the property owner. Any violations are first served with a warning. And if the water keeps flowing, residents are fined. The first fee because of the stage of drought we're in is $80. After that, it's 160, and we just keep following up on the issue until we don't see it anymore. Welcome to the greatest city on earth. I want to thank you very much for coming to Las Vegas. Even though water on the infamous Las Vegas Strip is everywhere, only 3% of the community's water supply is used by hotels. The rest is recycled. Every drop of water that reaches a drain in Las Vegas is treated and reused again. So you could put down another Manhattan right in the middle of this valley and not increase our water footprint in any significant way. Although recycling is one way to conserve scarce resources, recycling and other conservation efforts have their limits. Nevada is so worried about keeping future water flowing the agency has been drilling an $817 million tunnel under Lake Mead. A third attempt to capture more water as two higher tunnels are threatened by the lake's falling levels. And faced with the prospect that one of the tunnels could run dry before the third one was completed, the authority took emergency measures. Another tunnel, this one to stretch the life of the most threatened intake tunnel, until construction of the third one is finished. We were the first ones that had to meet the challenge. We've done that, but I personally see significantly bigger challenges coming down the road. So I certainly don't think we uh, can declare mission accomplished. The Basin study identified conservation as the low-hanging fruit. Um, for dealing with the imbalance between supply and demand. The, but that includes more than just municipal conservation. There's agricultural conservation as well. And drought is threatening our nation's food supply. California is the country's largest food supplier. Texas ranks second, and it has also seen severe drought. Possible disruption to the nation's food supply as a result of drought has led to the creation of the term food insecurity. Imagine going to the grocery store and there is no produce. Ranching and agriculture are the second largest sources of revenue for Arizona. That's why Arizona farmers, such as fourth generation farmer Kevin Rogers, have been eyeing water levels for years. Everything in the Southwest is irrigated where our, our brethren in the Midwest, uh, uh, you know, they, they plant and pray for rain, we irrigate. So we know at the beginning of the year how much water we're going to have for the year just based on our, our stockpile, our storage reservoirs, where they're at. And, and it affects us uh, daily. It affects us the grocery store. If we don't have enough water to produce what we grow, then the, the supplies get shorter and shorter. And sooner or later, we see it. Roger says technology that allows for less water usage is going to keep the agriculture economy alive. They talk about this new population boom, we got to feed, it's going to double by 2050. In order for us in agriculture to do that, we're hanging our hat on technology. We're going we're to have better resources with water, 
we can do better. And this technology allows us to plant crops that are more uh, drought tolerant, that don't take, don't require as much water. If I can grow a corn stalk and use 25 or 30 percent of the water I'm using today, that's a win-win. But technology cannot create water. And all water shortages in one water basin state make it worse for all the others, dependent as they are on the same sources. In the 1960s, California's legislators demanded first dibs on water as a condition of supporting federal legislation to build the Central Arizona Project, a vast web of canals. If rationing begins, Arizona would sacrifice some of its Colorado River allotment. And if Lake Mead continues to fall, Arizona would lose more than half its Colorado River water before California loses any. That would raise the price of water to customers, leading farmers to return to pumping groundwater for irrigation. Professor and author of Unquenchable, Robert Glennon calls this possibility an environmental disaster. Welcome to the Santa Cruz River. This was once a real river with cottonwood trees and willow trees and a rich riparian forest. The groundwater pumping has dried it up. And uh, it's not the only river in the United States like this. So it's all around the country. And it really is interfering with the hydrologic cycle. Mother Nature took thousands of years to accumulate the water in our aquifers, but we humans are pumping much of it out in mere decades, completely unsustainable. Those kinds of actions and a lack of precipitation have made Arizona so dry, the state is experiencing dust storms reminiscent of the 1930s. We need to collectively work on solutions to be able to uh, thrive in that drier future. But those solutions are not simple. There is no one thing that is going to solve the problem. Water rationing, conservation, technology, and hiking the price of water all help. But according to Professor Glennon and many others, those measures alone cannot solve the problem as long as more and more people are using diminishing resources there will be shortages. Population growth is the elephant in the room, not just in the water crisis, but every environmental problem. You can't name one that doesn't come down to the fact that there's too many of us. If current population growth trends continue, the nation's total population would cross the 400 million mark in the year 2051, reaching 420 million in 2060. Immigration, both legal and illegal, is the largest factor contributing to population growth in the U.S. It adds more than 2.25 million people on average to the U.S. population each year. Of the United States of America. Immigration is part of population growth and our national immigration policy is in dire need of reform. Everyone in the country understands that. And when we look forward, we should also be facing the question of the numbers of people, not just who gets in. Population growth and demand for water are within our control. The supply of water is not, which is why some experts say population growth needs to be on the table when we're talking about how to deal with the water crisis. And Glennon says the time to act is now. The crisis is real and people are losing their jobs and some communities have run out of water. It's an economic crisis, not just an environmental crisis. So we should take advantage of the opportunity presented by the crisis to act because there are choices to make, paths to decide whether to go down the left fork or the right fork. And if we make the right choice, then we can keep the crisis from becoming a catastrophe. And to do that, we need the moral courage and the political will to act.